that, as we give our offerings and our lives, we give unto the Lord. And we turn our ears and our hearts to now hear his word for us this day. And on this 21st Sunday of Pentecost, uh, first reading is from this obscure sounding book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. This will serve as the basis for our message today. And you'll notice all the passages deal with, um, you know, our true rest and satisfaction in life cannot come from anything else except from the Lord. And only he can do it. We can't do it on our own. So here we get a slice of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 to 20. Just listen to these words. The one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. When good things increase, the ones who consume them multiply. What then is the profit to the owner except to gaze at them with his eyes? The sleep of the worker is sweet whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich permits him no sleep. There's a sickening tragedy I've seen under the sun. Wealth kept by its owner to his harm. That wealth was lost in a bad venture, so when he fathered a son, he was empty-handed. As he came from his mother's womb, so he will go again, naked as he came. He will take nothing for his efforts that he can carry in his hands. This, too, is a sickening tragedy. Exactly as he comes, so he will go. What is the one gain who struggles for the wind? What is more? He eats in darkness all his days with much frustration, sickness, and anger. Here's what I've seen to be good. It is appropriate to eat, drink, and experience good in all the labor one does under the sun during the few days of his life God has given him because that is his reward. Furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also allowed him to enjoy them, take his reward, and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God, for he does not often consider the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. This is the word of the Lord. And then from Hebrews, chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest, God's rest, remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did. But the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way, and on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter it because of disobedience, He again specifies a certain day, today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest is rested from his own works, just as God did from his Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom We must give an account. This is the word of the Lord. 
And finally, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, where Jesus had spoken with the rich young ruler who didn't want to part from, with his possessions, and so he walked away. And Jesus now responds to his disciples in Mark 10, 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at his words. But again, Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, saying to one another, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. And Peter began to Tell them, well, look, we've left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we do pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, Lord, just expose our need for you. And uh, Lord, just grow us deep in our faith. Uh, Lord, that we would derive our life from you. In your name we pray. Amen. If I were to take a survey, I am absolutely certain every single one of you would answer yes to the question, do you want to enjoy a good, happy life? Wouldn't you all answer yes? I, I, I don't think there's anyone here who would answer no. I mean, do you know anyone who answered no, I don't want to enjoy a happy life? I mean, would anyone seriously? It's like, no, I want to have a miserable, unhappy life. I mean, seriously? But, you know, you'll find people who are grumpy and miserable and live unhappy lives. It's almost like their default mode. It's almost like they're stuck in this mind. So, well, it's, just, it's like Eeyore. That's just who I am. I'm just miserable, unhappy. And I, but I wish it was otherwise. But if everyone were to answer, they'd say, yes, of course, I want a truly happy, enjoyable life. And, you know, our whole culture is wired and designed and set up to hyper-stimulate feelings of of happiness and pleasure, to to try to give us a sense that we're enjoying the good life. You know, especially advertisers and, well, buy this new car and you'll be happier. This getaway vacation or enjoy this new experience or this new restaurant, you know. So many things in our culture enticing us. You want to be happy. You want to enjoy life. Or, or maybe it's living in a particular spot, in a particular area, or in a, having a, the right home and the right neighbors. You know, if you go to my home state of Nebraska, you know, if you drive Interstate 80 through Iowa, cross the bridge, the Missouri River, you'll see a sign that says, Welcome to Nebraska, the good life. And it's like, so does that mean like in Iowa, it's like not the good life? It's like it really stinks to live in Iowa. But, you know, you go to Nebraska, oh, man, you'll experience a good life. And, hey, Nebraska's a great state. Grew up there. Uh, you can have a good life in Nebraska. But living there is not going to guarantee that you're going to truly enjoy a good, happy life. And especially for all those Cornhusker fans you know, if you're going to try to drive your true and lasting happiness from how the Nebraska Cornhuskers play football, boy, I'll tell you, you got some miserable Nebraskans right now. You know, they're like, man, we lost against two Michigan teams, and then we lost against Minnesota yesterday. You know, oh, I, and they're just pulling their hair out. You know, there's days like, yeah, we love the Cornhuskers, and they're just so happy, but the other days, why can't they do anything? You know, it's kind of like writing happiness in the sand. The waves will come up, and before you know it, it'll erase the happiness. 
And you know, we experience moments of happiness and joy and pleasure, you know, in our lives. You know, eating at a good restaurant or, you know, bought a new car and it just feels wonderful. And you know, Moments in our lives where we just feel good, we enjoy life, or, but the waves roll up and they erase that word happiness and we have to write it in the sand again. It's, it doesn't penetrate deep. It's not true, lasting happiness. And so there's always a search. There's always a desire to grasp a hold of the good life. You know, there was a British style writer, Neil Borman, who a number of years ago was interviewed by the BBC. And uh, he admitted that growing up that he clung to name brand expensive items, you know, so badgered his mom. I want name brand, you know, expensive tennis shoes or whatever. And so he always had to have, you know, the nicest, newest things. And, and to him, that's what living the good life, enjoying life, being happy was all about. Until he reached the age of 31, and he's like, he doesn't do it. He said, it just left me with this continual dull ache. I said, it's not there. It's not in possessions. And so he told the BBC, I think I've decided what it is. I need simplicity. I need to get rid of my possessions. And so he actually told them, so this is why I'm burning all my stuff. To find real happiness, to find the real me. Well, you know, if I were to meet him today, I would wager that unless he's come to a life-transforming faith in Christ, burning all of his possessions and trying simplicity, though it probably lightened the load and probably provided the measure of relief and even some enjoyment and happiness for a while, he still hasn't found it. He's still searching. He's still pursuing it. As is everyone apart from Christ. For it is only in Christ that we know that life is only truly enjoyed as we enjoy God. The giver of life, the source and fount of life and joy and happiness. It's only in enjoying him that we truly enjoy life and know the good life. You know, this is really the conclusion you come to when you read this obscure kind of Old Testament book called Ecclesiastes. You know, the confirmation class are like, what is that? And they're memorizing the books. I'm like, well, you know, that, that's a, based on Latin and Greek from the Hebrew koheleth, which meant someone who convenes a group of people to teach them a lesson. And whoever the author is, the words of the person who wants to teach the lesson it looks like King Solomon, and that's what tradition says, so we'll call it King Solomon. He said he was king of Israel in Jerusalem, son of David, and he had great wealth, a mind to pursue wisdom, and he searches every avenue, and they're dead ends, to try to find what is the good life, to truly enjoy a good, happy life. And what does he learn? As we see from the little section that we read in our scripture reading from Ecclesiastes 5, one of the first conclusions he comes to is that nothing will satisfy our longings to truly enjoy life. Nothing. And, and here he makes reference to possessions and money. You know, when he says... You know, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with it. He says, this is futile, aimless, pointless. There's no use to it. Isn't it besides when things increase, then you want to consume more and more and more. And if you read Ecclesiastes, you realize, I mean, he tried everything. He's like, you know, I'm just going to, you know, maybe it's in pleasure. So I'm just going to have good food and wine and music. Maybe it's in, you know, having lots of possessions and big homes and gardens and trees. Maybe it's in relationships and, and you know, and, and maybe, though, it's being really smart. He tried that. Maybe it's in just being stupid. He tried that. Maybe I'll just be stupid and see if that works. If, no, that doesn't work. It's better to be wise than to, than to be foolish. And it's like, he tried everything and nothing worked. 
Now, what's the profit to the owner if you pile up all these possessions? Accept it. Gaze at them with his eyes. And he goes, now, if you're working really hard, boy, I'll tell you, it's good to sleep. But if you've got a lot of stuff, you can't sleep. Because all that stuff is a burden to maintain, to own, to watch, to guard. It's like a dry, cracked desert and trying to pour water on it and it just gets sucked up. Now, it's a reminder for us, nothing will satisfy. Nothing will satisfy that longing to truly enjoy life and find true, deep, lasting happiness. And and even as Christians, we need to be reminded of this. Because we can get distracted by by everything in our culture that's trying to entice us. And you notice when he's talking about wealth, he says, this too is futile. And so that's one of his conclusions from all this that he draws that, you know, nothing satisfies. I don't care if it's pleasure or wealth or status, achieving great things. None of this. Who we are, what we do, what we have, what we experience, it's not going to satisfy. Truly. It's futile. And and this gets to his opening lines, which he kind of cuts to the chase. And as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. What does a person gain for all of his efforts that he labors under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And he says, time marches on. The sun goes up and goes down. It comes up and goes down. And, you know, the wind blows around and around. And the waters go into the sea and back they go. And things never stop. And it's like, what's the point? Absolute futility. Now, that word sometimes is translated meaningless or you may know The King James, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All those don't quite do justice to the Hebrew, hevel. 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 It is all hevel. I'm teaching you a Hebrew word today. H-E-V-E-L. Hevel. And what does that mean? Vapor. Smoke. It's all vapor or smoke. And, you know, a little kid can be fascinated with smoke. I mean, it's just, oh, it looks beautiful. And it looks like something, you know, substantial. You know, and a little kid reaches out to grab a hold of the vapor or the smoke. And boom! It's transitory. It's fleeting. You can't grasp a hold of it. And that's the lesson he learns. That's the lesson God wants everyone to learn. That, that's the lesson, you know, that... I really believe God wants to shake up this nation and and some of the economic distress that we're heading to. He wants people to realize, you know what? It's vapor. You can't grasp all of these things to find your happiness. It's just going to disappear and vanish. And it just wearies us. It says all things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Hevel, vapor, smoke. You can't grab onto it. You can't hold onto it. And whenever we do try to grasp hold of anything as true happiness, it disappears. So it's interesting that Arthur Brooks in The Atlantic in October of last year, had an article, Are We Trading Our Happiness for Modern Comforts? Talking about the great paradox of American life, that even though we've gotten more comfortable, although things are getting a little rocky now, but we still have more than anyone else on the face of the earth. As we've gotten more comfortable over time, the happiness index keeps going down. The more we have, the more our happiness goes down. And he talks about, you know, our income's gone up, the size of our homes have gone up. But then he concludes, but amid these advances in quality of life across the income scale, average happiness is decreasing in the U.S. Why is that? Because it's heavy. And the Lord wants you to, you can't grab a hold of it. And yet God has put within us a sense that we are made for him. We're designed for the eternal God. We have a God-shaped hole in us that only he can fill. 
And whenever we try to grasp a hold of anything else, we end up empty. I mean, it's like a, apart from him, apart from Christ, it's like a black hole in our soul, a gravitational field, you know, that, we, you know, we just, we want to put anything, everything in that void except God. And yet, if you know anything about a black hole, anything caught in its gravitational pole is just destroyed. Ecclesiastes 3, he has also put eternity in their hearts. That There's a longing in the hearts of every man, woman, and child for the eternal, for the divine, for God himself. We were made for him. Yet, this is interesting. He says, but no one can discover the work of God the work God has done from beginning to end. It's like we're trying to put together this big puzzle on earth and we're chasing after this and that and trying to grab a hold of the vapor. And it's like, what's it all about? And the very things we try to grasp a hold of end up hurting, harming, and destroying us. And it ends in death. So the writer says, there is a sickening tragedy I have seen under the sun, wealth kept by its owner to his harm. And he describes a man who had a bad, maybe a bad real estate deal, stock market venture. Bad venture. He lost his wealth. So when he fathered his son, he was empty handed. And he says, by the way, you can't take anything with you when you die. You came into the world naked, you're going to leave naked. He who dies with the most toys dies. And that's it. And so he makes that very clear. He will take nothing for his efforts he can carry in his hands. This too is a sickening tragedy. Exactly as he comes, so he will go. What is the one gain who struggles for the wind? Vapor or wind, trying to grasp a hold of it. What is more, he eats in darkness all his days with much frustration, sickness, and anger. Or as he'll Go on to say in Ecclesiastes 9, there is an evil in all that is done under the sun. There's one fate for everyone. He says, man, it's no different. I don't care if you're wise, dumb, rich, poor, who you are, there's one fate. We all die. In addition, the hearts of people are full of evil and madness in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. He's like, we're no different than the animals. You know, Tracy asked me, so what are you preaching on? Ecclesiastes. Isn't that a depressing book? <laughs> I said, oh, but I love it. It's great. And why is it great? Because it just clears the stage. It says nothing can satisfy us apart from God. Yeah, it gets dark. It gets depressing. You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is heavy. You know, philosophers will love Ecclesiastes. But it gets us to the point that life cannot be truly enjoyed apart from God. He alone gives enjoyment and goodness and happiness in life. And so he concludes, another one of his conclusions in chapter 1, he said, I've seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, hevel, vapor, smoke, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Now notice this passage from chapter 2. He acknowledges, you know what, you might as well just give up trying to control things, grasp a hold of things, and just, okay, those little fleeting, pleasurable moments, just enjoy them. But notice what he says. There's nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. It's God who gives all that is good. Because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? The answer is no one. You can't enjoy life apart from him. So to truly enjoy life, to truly have a happy, joy-filled, satisfying life, you can't have it apart from him. And so at the very end of Ecclesiastes, this is when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands because this is for all humanity. He says, it only comes from an obedient relationship with him. To fear him, to honor, to reverence him. Or as the confirmation class will learn, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. 
and to obey his commands, his design for life. Because there will come a day of judgment, for God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. But here's the thing. If we were left with that, and this is how Ecclesiastes ends, strive and try as we might, we're going to fail. Yes, he calls us to fear, love, and trust in him above all things, to obey his commands. That's his design. But we fall short of the glory of God. We sin. So it's interesting. There was a book titled Crazy Rich Power Scandal and Tragedy Inside the Johnson & Johnson Dynasty. I'm talking about one of the Johnson men named uh, Robert Wood Johnson who was part of the big wealth of the J&J company, he was dying on a hospital bed. He had an immense fortune, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, his last words to one of his nurses before he died, shortly after 6 p.m. on January 30th, 1968, at the age of 74, were these words. I have millions, and I would give everything I have if someone could make me well. If someone could make me well. I'll tell you. Only Jesus can make us well. Only Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the longing that King Solomon was, was, felt in his heart and knew the answer was in God and in his mercy. And that it is Jesus. It is the life that God gives us in Jesus, the new life that he gives us through the sacrificial love of Jesus that fills that void, the only thing that fills that void. Because we can't do it on our own. And when Jesus confronted a rich young ruler who thought, you know, I've kept all the commandments. What else is there? Like, Jesus, okay, well, try this on for size. Sell everything and come follow me. If you want to keep the commandments... He couldn't do it. The disciples are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And Jesus says, you know, how hard it is for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. And we're all, by world standards, pretty wealthy. If you have more than you need to live on, that's me, we're pretty wealthy. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And so they're like, well, who can be saved? With man, it's impossible. And he wants to bring us to that point. I can't do it. I need help. I can't achieve, grasp, a hold of find true joy, true happiness, but not with God because all things are possible with God. And that he has given his life in his son Jesus who assumed our human flesh and blood to come into the void, into the darkness, into death itself, to fill it with his self-giving love that gives life. And Jesus describes it as like he's the bread from heaven that nourishes our soul who gives us life. Jesus says, truly I tell you, this is from John 6, anyone who believes, who trusts in him, has eternal life. Not will, but has. Present tense. You have the life of God in you when you believe in me. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. The divine son of the Father who took on our humanity, who united himself with us, that we might be reunited with God and share in his life. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The sacrifice of his body to die for us, to step into the void at the cross and in death, not only to forgive us of our sins, to conquer death, but to give us his righteousness, to give us his life so that we might share in that divine life and know the true joy of our Heavenly Father. So the one who feeds on me will live. Not will live after you die. You will, but beginning today because of me. That God has given his all 
in Jesus at the cross by his resurrection to fill the void so that we might enter into that life, that joy, that rest of the divine life. So that as you receive the life of Jesus, enjoy God. Find joy in God and all of his gifts. And you see, it really is deriving our life, our satisfaction, our joy, our true happiness from him. As Jesus talks about it as like a branch being connected to the vine, he says, remain in me. That by faith, we derive our satisfaction. We derive our happiness. We derive our joy from him. He says, and then I will remain in you. I will fill you with my peace. I'll fill you with life from the Father and true joy. Look at his words. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. So this is a a continual and daily Drawing from Christ by faith, receiving, taking fully to heart the life that is in him, the supernatural gift of the joy that comes from the Father. Because he says, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And this is a, a joy, an enjoyment of God and of life that surpasses just circumstantial, you know, feelings and happiness. It is the supernatural joy of the Lord and his presence. That you, by faith, have been united to Mr. Joy himself. You've been united to the source of life itself. So that Luther would call joy the foundational experience of the Christian life. And that it is something, it it doesn't depend on circumstances or emotions, but is a supernatural gift for us to claim, receive, and take to heart. Which is why Paul, who's writing from prison, says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Derive your joy, your enjoyment of life, your true happiness in him. I love what the psalmist says. You reveal the path of life to me in your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. The striving ceases. The searching, the striving, because there's a Sabbath rest. And we double back to, circle back to Ecclesiastes when he says, you know what, here's what I've seen to be good. This is fulfilled in Christ for us. It's appropriate to eat, drink, experience good and all the labor one does under the sun. During the few days of his life, God has given him because that is his reward. Furthermore, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth, he's also allowed him to enjoy them. Take his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God. We receive it all as a gift from God when we find our enjoyment in him. We enjoy all of his gifts with open hands because we're grasping a hold of only him. For he does not often consider the days of his life. We're not all anxious and worried about what about next week or next year because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Enjoy God. Enjoy Jesus. The psalmist says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I want to close with this quote from Jonathan Edwards, famous American theologian. The enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls could be satisfied. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, or children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows. Yes, they can be enjoyed as one of God's gifts, but they're only shadows. But enjoyment of God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. Find your joy in the Lord. Delight in him. And he will give you the desires of your heart, which is to love him, to serve him, to know his word. And he'll fulfill those desires with joy and peace, even in the midst of hardship and heartache and sorrow, to know know the joy in the Lord as we enjoy him. 
the life we have in Jesus. Amen? Please stand.